Well, some breeders argue that it's better to raise the Queensland you use, it's better to raise them in local conditions rather than, say, set, ask somebody from Queensland from a warmer climate to mail your queen here who will have to adapt to a cooler climate. Whether that's a valid, um, a valid reason, uh, I'm not sure, but I do. The, the, um, when I talk about French Hill Acres, Michael Palmer, um, he used to, who's in the US, he used to order all his queens from North Carolina and Florida and the hotter climates in the US, and he was expecting those queens to overwinter in, and the colonies to overwinter in four feet of snow during the winter. So um, in the end, he started producing his own queens in Vermont, um, yeah, ba based on local conditions. Um, another reason to raise your own queens is to um, improve the genetics and the performance in your own own colonies, um, so you have better better colonies. Um, and another reason can be the queens are expensive to buy. Um, if, if you only have to buy one, one or two for your apiary, then it's it's not not such a big cost. But if you have a few hives like I do, then you know, thirty-five dollars, forty dollars a pop for a queen can be quite expensive. So if you can learn to graft your own queens and raise your own queens, it's a time investment rather than a rather than a um, monetary investment. And um, as most beekeepers know, it's just and with a lot of hobbies, it's it's a money pit. You're always putting money money into it. Um, and I guess the best reason about raising queens is, is, is it's, it's fun. Um, it's a fun thing to do. But um, be prepared to make mistakes. Um, learn and adapt to what suits your operation. I think that's the most critical thing. Make it adapt to what you're doing. Um, you can make it as easy or involved as you like. I guess one of the easiest ways Possibly of raising your own queens is if one of your really, if one of your good colonies decides to swarm and produce a whole lot of queen cells, instead of, um, and I know I'm guilty of this, you scrape the queen cells off because you don't don't need them. But those queens could be really good quality queens that the hive has made. Um, you could potentially cut, carefully cut around them and cut them out and take them off your frame, make up some maybe some five frame nucleus hives, queenless hives, and you could slip those queen cells, you know, one, one per nucleus hive into your nuke hive and, and let the queen hatch and um, go on its mating flight and come back and, you, you know, you, you've got a queen free of charge. Um, so that's probably the easiest way of raising your own queens when you're a small hobbyist beekeeper. Or the other way which I'm going to talk about now is you can graft larva um, from your frames of the, of the right age. Um, and what what do we mean by... Sorry, I'm just looking for something. <laughs> don't know if I've... Get it in a minute. Haha. <laughs> 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 um, you can graft larva of the right age from brood from your from your own hives. Um, so to graft larva, we need a grafting tool, and this is a this is a Chinese grafting tool, very common and popular. Um, it has a, a little flexible end. Okay, and this is what um, these are very cheap. They're only a few dollars. Some people just use. Some people get. I, I, I went to one field day and the. One of the beekeepers he got a match, a long matchstick, I think, or something like that, and he just got his, he'd get his pen knife and he'd whittle that bit away to taper it down, then he'd get, get it in his teeth and sort of fashion it in his teeth, and that's what he used as a grafting tool. But um, these are very cheap and inexpensive to use. Um, so if you're at home, the type of what what you first want to do is go out and identify. A frame 
that's suitable for grafting larva. So I, I know some of you are fairly new and, and you're not, you might not be totally up with all of the, um, the different stages of the bee cycle, but just imagine this is a, um, a frame that I got out of the brood area of my hive. Um, and the frame's got, it, it's open brood and it's, it's larva. And so, as m most of us know, the queen lays in a spiral pattern, so she lays in circles. So, um, when you look at the frame, if, if there's lots of older larva in the middle that are like five to seven days old, they're big and large, if you work your way out from the from the older larva towards the outer part, or vice versa, um, you'll come back to the egg stage, the eggs that she's laying right now, okay? And so if you come back to the egg stage and then go just a little bit back in, you'll you'll potentially find larva that are the, about, about the right age and there's ideally from my knowledge they need to be about 12 to 24 hours old or less than a day old and that's and that's where you'll find them just slightly in from the from the egg stage and and so you've got your frame when you take your I didn't bring out detail I think but what most people, beekeepers do, when they take a frame out of their hive, they have a damp cloth or something like that, and they'll, they'll just cover, they'll just put the cloth over the frame, slightly damp, just to keep a bit of humidity there, because um, if you take the frame out and it's a windy day or something like that, you're going to dry, pick it, the larva's going to dry up and then you're going to potentially kill them. So you just want to cover the frame and have it just a little bit moist, just to provide a bit of humidity there. Um, and then when you come inside, you might, you might have something like this at an angle, okay? And you put, your, you put your frame down. You might have a headlamp on so you can shine, shine into, the, into the frame to look down into those cells and you'll, you'll identify the correct age larva and you'll get your little hive tool and you'll poke it down into the cell and it'll curl around the bottom and it'll go under the little puddle of royal jelly and then you pick it up and you'll have the larva sitting on the end of the hive tool, uh, on the end of the um, grafting tool on the little nib there and then I haven't talked about this yet but this is the frame that you put in your cell builder hive so these are cell cups okay so you'll have this close by and there's a little button on the end of this grafting tool and when I push that, it'll push another little thing down it and, and it'll gently push the little larva off, off the, the thing. So you'll, then you'll come to put your grafting tool into the cup and you'll just gently put it down and then you'll push the button and it'll slide that little larva off into this cup and so you'll you'll go along and you'll fill that frame up. Big commercial beekeepers, they could have two or three rows here, so they could, on one frame, they could make 30, 40 queen cells, okay? Oh, the grafts. Um, so that, and, yeah. Um, the old bee, you know, the really old beekeepers, or the, not, not all old beekeepers, but the really experienced ones, they might just drive out to their apiary in the field and they'll be sitting in their truck with the door open or something, they'll just have the frame on their knee and they'll have this maybe on the side of the seat here and they'll just, they're so, they're so adapted at it and quick at it, they'll just go, you know, they're pretty, they're pretty quick. Um, and that's how they do it, but um, if I'm doing it, I do it at home. Um, Lava had breathing holes too. They, I can't remember, Stan would know what they, what are the little breathing holes? in the lava? Do you remember that? I know, I know you mentioned it. Anyway, they have... The, yeah, they have little... What are they? Sorry? Yep. They have little breathing holes. So when you pick up the lava and put it in the cup, you have to be careful that you put it up the right way because if you put it around the wrong way, they can basically, well, they'll die or drown. So there's a little bit of school talk, but from, 
from what I've seen, pe people can pick up grafting lava pretty, pretty, with a bit of practice they can pick it up pretty well. And some people are really good at it and really take to it really quickly. Um, so sourcing, yeah, how to look after your frame of brood, I talked about that with putting the, the cloth over it and where you've got grafts of lava. Um, another way is there are commercial kits like they're called Genta, J-E-N-T-E-R or, or Nico, N-I-C-O-T. Um, I'm, I'm not totally familiar with them, but you, basically you put this plastic panel that have little cups in them. You can embed them in your in a brood frame, and I think you isolate the queen over that little panel for a day or two, and she lays all the eggs in smaller cups than this, and then you basically you take the little cups out and click them in to this. Um, and then you don't, it's a sort of, a, instead of having to graft yourself the queen and lay the eggs. Personally, I haven't used them, um, so I can't sort of say how easy they are to use. Um, so then, after, after we've put our larva of the right age here, we turn the frame up like this, and we put, put this frame, and we set up what's called a cell builder colony. Um, and usually it's a strong double hive and this colony, and it's queenless, um, there's no queen in there, and this um, hive will feed and care for the queen cells um, after we've started. So they'll, they'll, draw, they'll draw the queen cell down from the cup and they'll feed the developing larva royal jelly inside. And we leave, leave the, um, the frame in there for a few days. I can't remember exactly how many days. Um, and the thing with the, um, a few things with the cell builder is you need lots of nurse bees. Nurse bees are the bees that feed and care for the developing larva. Nurse bees are the, some of the younger bees in the colony. They're, they're, the older bees are the ones that are out flying gathering nectar and pollen. The nurse bees are very young bees and one of their first duties is to care for and look after the, the developing uh, larva. Um, another, another thing you need in a cell builder colony is a good frame of pollen that you sit next to, slot next to these developing cells because the pollen contains protein and protein and the developing larva need lots of protein. They need protein and carbohydrate and that help makes the royal jelly. Okay. Um, before you oh sorry I should say before you put the um, the frame in the the cell builder, you just leave it long enough to for the bees to realise that they're queenless. Um, and then and then they they just or a great term that I heard over in the US is hopelessly queenless. They've got, they've got the resources to make the queen cells. They don't have a queen. They're absolutely dying to make a queen. And so when you put this in, they've got the resources and the will to, to draw out these queen cells. Um, and the cell builder colony, what it's doing is it's um, playing on the, the um, the emergency response, okay, so the, we call it the emergency response, the, queen, the, the bees need to make a queen to survive, so that's what they're, they're at. You're, you're setting up the cell builder um, to mimic an emergency response. So after a few days you need to, to take this frame out of what we call the cell builder and put it in a cell finisher. If we leave it in the cell builder, they'll still continue to they, won't, they might start all these cells, but they'll just, in the end, they'll just start to concentrate on a few of them. Okay, so we need, so what we do is we put it into, we change the hive setup and we put it into a cell finisher. Um, and what the cell finisher is um, mimicking is what we call the supersedure response. So the bees will still, so, it's so 
sorry, the cell finisher is a queen is a queen right colony now. You have a there is a queen in the colony, but when you put this in, the bees will see that there's developing queen cells, but they'll still look after the queen cells because they think that they're going to supersede the queen. And in the cell finisher they'll actually care for all the cells really well. Um, okay, so We've finished with the cell, we've had them in the cell finisher for a while. Um, maybe it's about day 14, day 15. We know that a queen hatches at day 16. So we need to probably put, we need to put these queen cells, once they're, they're fully developed in the, in the cell finisher, we need to take these, carefully take these the queen cells off and place them in what we call a mating nuke. Now a mating nuke, they all come in different, shapes and sizes. You can have tiny little mating nukes with 200 bees. Mating nukes are queenless, okay? Um, mating nukes um, can be tiny little hives with only a couple of hundred bees in them, or they can be like five frame nucleus boxes with a few thousand bees in it. They, they come in all shapes and sizes and you just have to decide what you want to work with if you um, raise queens yourself. So, the cells are placed in the mating nuke. The queen hatches at day 16. She's a, the vir she's a virgin queen. Um, she'll go out, she'll leave the mating nuke, she'll go out on her mating flight what, to what's called a drone congregation area in the sky, usually a well geographic geographically marked area like a, a football oval with a, a ring of trees around it or a little valley. Um, all the drones sort of they hang out up there at a certain time of the afternoon um, and the queen zooms past and the drones just go and they and the queen mates with about I'm not sure if they've got an exact number but usually about 15 drones okay so she'll have she'll she'll gather about the same in about 15 drones so that so that's where she gets her genetic diversity from and then she'll return to the mating nuke um, and then she'll begin laying after a few days um, and then the beekeeper will come back and he'll, he'll open up the mating, he'll open the mating nuke and um, sometimes they don't initially necessarily have to see the queen, they just, they'll pick up a brood frame and they'll look at the frame, yes there's eggs there so they know the queen's laying, and then they'll catch the queen. And if they're selling it, then they'll put it in a queen cage with a few attendants, and they'll, they'll mail it off to whoever wants the queen, or or you or you'll transfer it into a colony that that um, you find appropriate to use it in. Um, okay, so that's sort of a basic run over of the very basic run over of the process. And as I said, you can adapt. You know, you can buy books like this, Queen, Queen Breeding, and it'll tell you, it'll, it'll tell you all the, you know, the things that you need to know, all the, the core information that you need to know. And then, um, as, a, as a small beekeeper, you know, you're not, you make up, if you were to make up like one row or even two rows, you'd have so many queens that you wouldn't know probably what to do with them, and each queen's going to need a mating nuke, um, so, as I said, you need, you probably, if you want a queen breed, you probably adapt to your operation. If you've only got four hives and you want to produce queens, then you maybe, maybe you'll just set up a, maybe you could just set up a, a hive to make four queens, for, you know, every year or two. Um, I just wanted to use Rob Franson as a, if Rob doesn't mind, as an, an example, because I know Rob started doing this process and doing long cell bars of and he decided, you decided, Rob, that that wasn't really for you, didn't you? And you've totally put it on its head, in a way, to my thinking, and, and you've really adapted it to how you... Um, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, I'm in the middle of a queen rearing process, and there are lots of different methods you can use to raise queens up. Um, one of them has disadvantages, and the others have advantages. Um, 
process where there's a lot of steps in the process, as Peter explained, and every, every step you hope, right, we're going to pass that step, we can go to the next one. If you fail one step, you go back, Queen dies, you go back to the start again, and you try again. But it is very interesting, and I do it solely for that reason, no, secondly for that reason, first reason is, I think what it limits the swarming. You have a young queen in your hive, it doesn't stop the swarming, but it will limit swarming the following year. You've got a new queen in your hive. So I try to keep young queens in my hive for that reason. Um, hmm. Yeah, so I'd suggest if, if you want to go to the meet the field day and see Rob's operation and see what he does, then take that opportunity um, or talk to him later. I won't try to, uh, I won't steal his fire and say what he does. He can, if you're interested, then have a chat with him and, and see the way he does it. It's quite, he's, uh, he's, he's quite good at what he does for his small operation. Um, and then, oh, yeah, to improve your colonies, I guess with queen reading is you have to decide what traits or attributes you are looking for in a queen or for what your colony wants. So um, what attributes do we want our hives to have? Um, I, can, I can suggest the first one, docility. We, want, we don't want bees jumping out at us from our hives and sting us every time we um, every time we open the hive. So we're going to choose. So when we um, look at our hives, say I've, say I've got ten hives and I want to start raising queens, then I have to assess those hives. I've got to um, and and make notes about each hive. So docility would be one one of them. Um, I don't want an aggressive hive. Um, can somebody else suggest an attribute that, they, that you'd want in a point? Production. Production, exactly. Yeah, if you've got if you've got a bunch of hives there and there's a hive only producing 10 kilos of honey a year and the one down there is producing 80 kilos a year, then which which hive are you going to graft larva from? You're going to obviously choose the the one that's going gangbusters. Um, um, house cleaning is another great attribute. Um, um, the, chat, the photos I'm going to show you in a little while, Michael Palmer, he does not graft from any hives that has chalk brood. Uh, any, any chalk brood he sees in a hive, he will never graft from it. Um, so uh, you want bees that are, are good, good house cleaners and, and that get rid of uh, Chalk, well, chalk is an example anyway. Um, Explain what chalk is. So, sorry, chalk root is a, is a fungal disease that in, infects the developing larva. Um, the bees, when they're feeding the developing larva, um, it's a fungal spore that enters, enters the developing larva and they basically um, it, it multiplies in the gut of the of the larva, and by the time the by the time the larva is dead, it's a little it's a bit, looks looks like a tooth. It's it's just a little chalky mummy, and they these are little chalk brood mummies. They contain billions of spores, and then if you're not if you have them in your hive and you don't clean them up and dispose of them in the rubbish, then you, you can potentially spread it. So. Yeah, so house cleaning is a, is a good attribute to select in a queen. And another one which Michael Palmer talks about um, is he doesn't like jittery bees or bee, when he is inspecting a frame, he doesn't like bees that sort of hang and drip off the frame in bunches or or are jittery and sort of running around the frame. He likes calmness on the comb. So that's another attribute that you could potentially select for. So what I'm, basically what I'm saying is you need to assess your own hives and choose the and, and choose the hive, choose the queen from the hive that you think it will give you the best colonies. Um, uh, what else was it? 
Well, another, another thing I was, great thing I heard was when you, if, if and when you do start um, producing queens, a great idea I heard was if, you, if there's other beekeepers in the area, um, you, have, you have to remember that the queen provides 50% of the genetics, okay, and then the wild drones out in the air, they're contributing the, either the drones from your hives or the beekeepers hive down the road or the wild hives in the trees, they're contributing the other half of the genetics for queen cells, for, for queen bees and worker bees. Drone bees only have Drone bees only have genetic material contributed by the queen, okay? Um, but, so what I'm saying is that if you start producing nice queens, a good idea is to gift, gift some of these queens to your local beekeeper friends and say, try them out. And so they'll put them in their hives. Oh, free queen, great, I'll try, you know. And so their hives will be starting to produce the genetics that you like. Um, and yeah, and so that, that way you can, the area around your, where you're breeding, you're basically flood, increasing the genetics that you want. Um, as, I, yeah, as I said, uh, lots, uh, hang on a second, I've just lost where I am. Um, yeah, so basically that's what I had to say. That's a, a basically run, a basic run over of um, a very basic run over of um, queen rearing. Um, some books that I can suggest, uh, some more information that I can suggest if if you're interested. I follow a few people on YouTube. Um, this chap, Michael Palmer, French French L.A. Chris, he's great great videos on queen rearing. Um, there's another guy in Arkansas in the US, Bob Binney. Um, he's really good. Um, and a chap that I follow in, in France, um, in Brittany in France, Richard Knoll, um, another queen breeder. And, and they all, they might be bigger operations than what you would want, but just to see the way they do things is re really inspiring. Um, books, like uh, if you're interested in B, I'd, I'd recommend this. Ag skill book on queen breeding. Really, have come and have a flick through. It's just, yeah, really good technical book. Um, now we are in the early throes of discussing a course, you know, a queen rearing course um, for the club. Where we either want, want to get somebody in from from outside the area who's really good on teaching queen rearing, and um, or we'll develop our own little course. So. Um, I'd like to be optimistic and say that we'll have something next season. I'm going to leave a bit of paper here. I'd, I'd really like, if anybody's interested in knowing more, if they could just come and write their name down, and um, at least we can just try and get a no some numbers um, of who might be interested. Okay, so there's enough talking. I thought I'd just show you um, some pictures. So. A few years ago, I went to visit my brother in the U.S. and I thought, well, I'm over in the U.S. US in the summer. I should go and visit a beekeeper. So I knew about Michael Palmer at French Hill Aperies in Vermont in the U.S. So I just, I just sent him an email and said, look, I'm going to be over there. Would you mind if I you know, came and um, hang, hung out with you for a week or so? And yeah, he was really obliging. So um, I was telling you about this. The, that they're building the, the queen cells in here and they've got a pollen, pollen frame next to it and some brood frames and some extra nectar. And this box up here, you'll see in a while, he feeds some extra sugar syrup as well. Okay, Colin. And, then, and there you can see. So even though they might have lots of honey in that, they, they just feed, feed, feed. Um, and this, this would be one to one sugar syrup that they feed as well. Um, and because, as I said before, to produce queen cells, you need lots of royal jelly, and for royal jelly, you need lots of nectar and lots of pollen. Thanks, Paul. And this this is a frame that's come out of the the cell finisher. Okay, so you can see all the beautiful queen cells, and sometimes they they build a bit of bird bird comb between the 
between the cells which they have to cut off. Um, but at that at that stage, that's all right, well, at that stage, um, when the when those cells have been built out, you have to be really careful. Where you drop if you drop the frame, you could potentially have, even though you, you may not have broken the set, the queen cells, just that jolting shake could potentially kill the queens in those queen cells. So you have to be really careful at that stage. Now, as I was just starting to say at the start, my partner, he runs what's what he calls sustainable apiaries. So this, these apiaries here are, are solely for supplying his whole beekeeping operation, whether it's queen rearing or boosting his honey production hives um, or, or splitting off nu nuke hives. He has a, he runs these are 10 frame boxes and they're divided in two so, and they have an entrance at one, one side and an entrance at the other and then he stacks um, I think they're full frame full frame nucleus boxes going up okay and if he needs any any bees for his queen rearing or or anything in his operation he, he draws them from these colonies here he doesn't he doesn't take resources away from his his main production hives, um, and, and he makes every year he makes I think he produces about three thousand queens, hundreds of nucleus colonies he sells, and he still makes and also produces hundreds of kilos of, of honey off these these um, support hives as well. Um, so this is a a. a, a a mating area, so all these little, all these boxes here, scattered through the field, are, are mating nukes. And in, in any one area, you'd have I can't remember exactly 50 to 100 boxes. Thanks, Colin. And so, um, after the queen cells were produced, after you've got your queen cells now, I went out with Zach, and we were putting the the queen cells in the mating nukes. So these are four. Four mating nukes, four colonies in one, one box, so we put one queen cell in each box. And then that's just showing you that the queen cell is carefully placed between the frames, just wedged between the frames at the top. And that's when, this is when, um, after the bees of queens have mated and they've come back, this is what what they call queen catch day. So you so you open it's four four colonies. So you just open up one at a time, um, and then look through the frames. To um, first of all, you you look. Yep, there's eggs there. Okay, find look, and then um, you you find the queen. And there's just me um, inspecting a. A small frame there, and it was a fantastic experience. These are, I think, one or both of these guys. They're school teachers. They don't get paid over the over the U.S. holidays. They don't, they don't get money, so they come and get paid by Michael Palmer to, to work for him. And this older woman here, she's only she only had just got into beekeeping. Uh, no bee suits or anything like this. It's just. Um, yeah, it was just, it was really great. And then sometimes, even in these little boxes, um, it can be really hard to find the queen, so it's like all hands on deck trying to find this queen. Um, and so when a queen was found, you would say, I, I found a queen in the little nuke box, so I'd carefully pick her, I'd, actually I'd just take the frame. I'd, the queen would be on the frame, I would take it back to Michael Palmer, He's, he's, he's just got a little table here, set on a box. He's got his little little pot of white marking paint here. There's a few little few nurse bees gathered up in that corner there, um, and he would mark the he'd mark the queen with his model paint with the right colour, and he'd have to pick up a few of those little bees and stick them in the queen cage and stick a cork on it, and that, and then he, he would mail that to somewhere in the US. And this is what he uses to mark his queens is he just gets what they call a bit of Timothy grass. He just strips back a bit of grass 
and just dips it in the, the model paint and you can see that he's carefully got the, the clean there between his fingers and you can see all the, see all the little holes in his fingers. Whereas, yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then there he's just showing how he, how he likes to gently hold the coin, how it just sort of wraps its abdomen around, it, around his finger there. Nice beekeeping hands there. Um, this is having lunch in the apiary, just with all the bees flying around here. It's, um, and uh, it was really hot and humid, so, so the odd, odd can of pale ale was really welcome. And, um, and these are some of his production colonies, so he doesn't, so he uses, you can see, I think, I think they're an ideal box, yeah, ideal boxes, I think, or maybe WSPs. Yeah, so they're. They're just over the season they just get higher and higher and um, the honey flows are just amazing. Um, and who knows what the fence is for? Yeah. Bears, yeah, yeah. So he has bear colon, electric fence. A bear would, could totally demolish that colon in, in no time at all. Um, and just one quick, one final thing. This little cage here, which is bent, bent over, they're, they're called, a few people are just using them, they're called pushing cages. So if Mike has to re clean a really big, strong colony, sometimes it's very hard for them to ex accept the queen. So um, what he does is he'll, he'll get the new queen and he'll pop it on the frame and then he'll push this gauze cage over, over the queen and then he'll put the frame back in the hive for a few days and she'll, she'll be there and she'll just lay that little area out under the cage and the, and the bees just get used to it. And then he'll come back, I can't remember how long, a couple of days or so later and then he'll just lift that gauze off and everything will be, be right, the colony will be used to it. And the final picture, anybody see anything on that picture? Baroa. Baroa. Baroa, yeah, because I... Just there. There's a Varroa mite. That's probably for new people. Oh, that parasitic mite there. That for, for our new beekeepers. That's that's what we never, never want in Australia. Okay. I can't. We, I was at one of the mating the queen catch days, and I, I commented to somebody, oh, I haven't seen a Varroa mite yet, and they said, oh, you probably find one in these mating nukes, and I saw one the whole time. And I think it was a little bit heartening that. He was doing so well, and you know, he was. He, they'd, they'd sort of adapted to it and had moved on from the initial shock of getting varroa mite in the U.S. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's the queen rearing side of things. So I hope you've all got a, a little bit out of that. Um, so on to we've still got a reasonable amount of time, and I, I won't talk. I'll sort of let people. Um, Add, add to this now. So we can talk. We'll just talk about um, the season um, so far. Um, I'll probably say, for me, for the last for the last ten years, it's probably been the most challenging season for me, um, and, and from the, from the start. Um, it was a cold, wet start to the season, and generally there were many reports of people losing hives to starvation, and I. I met a few beekeepers that had lost their hives, unfortunately. Personally, I was lucky. I, I it got to a point at the start of the season. I was really shocked. At my some a lot of my hives came out really strong at, at the end of winter, and there were lots of honey stores on it. But a few weeks into spring, they just went went through all the honey. Oh, well, a lot of it, and I was really shocked with how light the colonies got. And um, personally, I don't mind feeding sugar syrup if it's necessary. Um, so I fed sugar syrup and um, I didn't lose any hives. Um, a lot of my hives are put on good stores again. Um, I, I, I don't envisage that I will take a lot of honey off this season, but I'm more, I'm, I just want to get my colonies strong um, and, and ready for the next winter at this stage. And, um, if I don't get much honey, then so be it. Um, recently, I did put on some supers in some locations, as there'd been some nectar flowing, and we're ho hopeful of getting a modest crop. Um, I've had some weaker hives that I've been concentrating on, supplementary feeding, possibly, if I need to. With, um, 
I like, if I have to feed any hives for winter, I'd rather do it while it's warm. I'm not sure what autumn's going to be like once it starts. I'd rather, I'd rather get their honey, if they're light on, I'd rather get their honey stores up now um, um, rather than leave it too late. Um, look, uh, yeah, this is all just general stuff. I've, I've been talking a long time. I'd rather like to let you guys do some talking, I think. Um, and then I'll just tell you about one other piece of equipment that I started using this term. So, come on, who's, who wants to comment on this season? Okay. Uh, Stan or... Um, David, how are you going? You're not, you're not the only one, David, yeah, so don't. <laughs> um, David mentioned wax moth for new beekeepers. Wax moth is another pest that can affect hives, usually weak hives. If the hive is strong and lots of bees, then they can, they can keep that under control. But if, usually if your hive gets weak um, or you've got too many boxes on your hive and they can't defend the space, then wax moth can, can get in and really um, 
destroy your frames and yeah, it's a, quite a mess. And um, small high beetle. Sorry? Small high and small high beetle, yeah, as stands, and small high beetle as well as another pest that affects weak hives, um, weak colonies, um, which can cause what's called a slime out. Um, yeah, so there are two, two names, two, two things you can remember, wax moth and small hive beetle. Um, Jeff, how's your operation going down? Well, I brought one back and last year I probably took 60 kilos out of it, this year I've got about 30. Yeah, Jeff's down in Venus Bayway, yeah? yeah? Oh, okay, so you're down a bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and Amanda, how are you going? Is Amanda Diamond here? No. I, th I thought Amanda was sitting there with <laughs> some masks. I could, yeah, that's all right, no worries. <laughs> Amanda's not here. Um, Steve, love you. Yeah. Anyone else? I'm too worried. Probably a good thing. Um, well, I look after nine hives, and I've got a few of them are up. A couple of me out the door, and three of them hang out. They all went to breathe pretty well, um, but a few more ones have been an absolute disaster. I lay at the hives that they do the best, and I lay at the north ones. Um, started off well, then I think due to the weather, they had a bit of a bad drop there, and they couldn't get out to get the nectar. But this year I'll be taking, which is not very good fire security, I understand that, but I'll be taking the stores from, I'd say, my lay out of my legs, mm. so prop up my two water of mines, and I'll be uniting a couple of mines mm. to two water of I certainly did that with, a, I've got a couple of hives next, next to each other down at Waddle Bank and one hive doing really well. Both both queen, both have co queen right colonies but one hive not so well but the one next to it had an extra box of honey so I just, I put that on that one, on the, on the weaker one. What else would you do? I mean, I mean they're right next to each other so, and yeah. Using, using mm. the yeah. 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 Uh, who else? Um, Rob? Yeah, one thing I've noticed um, I've got to watch for is um, just because we've got the, the, the hives are three high, we've got two brood boxes, say a queen excluder, and the top box, top two, and in some cases it's full of honey, and I think, oh, that's mine to take. But on further inspection, I notice that the bees are really working the, the queen excluder and the, all the brood is just below the queen excluder. So in that case it's careful not, you shouldn't be taking it even the top box off and be careful that you're leaving with enough winter stores. In, mm. in that particular case I found that, I removed the bottom box completely mm. and then just rotated it around mm. and the, just to give it a track that some bee keepers and almost myself fall into Oh, just because the top box is full doesn't mean that no. you can yeah. take, take it. Yeah, and I was just I was talking to David Walker down the back before and we are both saying you can't be greedy with taking honey off hives. If you've got, if you've got a double, double box hive, you want to leave a, pretty much a full box of honey on the set top, second box up, okay? At least six, eight frames of solid honey to get over winter. Okay, and into spring. You can always, if there's excess honey in spring, well, you can always take it then, but at least leave a full, for a double box, leave a full box on. For if you have a single box, you probably want four, this is my opinion, you put your four solid frames of honey, two on each side. So two frames of solid honey, two frames of solid honey, and then you brood in the center, okay? Um, don't be greedy. You can always take it in spring. Um, um, sorry, Colin. Yeah. I'll do that, Paul. Yeah. Uh, Peter, I've, something I've noticed is um, generally late December, anything we harvest is eucalypts or a tea tree or something like that. Nice dark blades of honey, and then in um, uh, January, February, we get the clover. Hmm. Well, this year I seem to have missed. 
that first uh, lot of honey, that we haven't really got the eucalyptus mm. the tea tree, and we're getting, we are getting honey now, but it's the clover honey, it's the lighter honey. Yeah. So um, I think the rain took away uh, that uh, that first lot of honey or nectar that we might have got. Yeah, I mean we had, with with for new people with with spring, if it's cold and wet, you've got the rain destroys the flowers, the temperature, the nectar just doesn't flow if it's cold for a long time, and then you've got extreme weather which just destroys flowers as well. So I mean, we we had it all really in spring, and that and that just doesn't do well for for bees um, putting on honey. Um, who else? Um, Graham down the back. I've got a colonies near you. Mine are just my ones in Langatha. They're just, they're okay, but they're not not. I'm not going to be taking honey off them. I don't think. Yeah. Right? And how, how are yours going? Yeah. I'm giving. I mean, for somebody like Dennis. Um, some of them, they're, they're nothing new, but um, I've never used them before. But I started started using them this season. Um, one 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 thing I've used them for is if I've had a had a had a couple of hives that swarmed. Okay, and so I've got lots of queen cells in the swarm. And usually, I when I hive swarms, I'll knock it down to two queen cells, and. Um, the first queen, the theory is the first queen that hatches will destroy the other queen and the colony will re-establish itself. From what I understand, it's about 75%, 80% success for, for a queen to, after, after, after a hive swarms, for them to produce a new queen successfully, 75 to 80%. So I got these, built these divider boards and what I did this season is I kept four queen cells, I kept two queen cells on one frame, two queen cells on the other, and I split the colony and I put one up the top of the divider board and one down the bottom. So you had a, the end, one, one entrance up here and the other entrance down there. So one hive, both colonies were successful. So my original hive swarm, but now I had two queen right colonies. And in the other one, one of the one of the boxes was successful, so then I just merged the queenless box with the queen right one. So, so that's one really good use. I thought it's good with these divider boards. Um, and the other thing, sometimes I have some some weaker colonies going into winter, some single boxes. So, an, another thing with these is, oh, as you can see, I didn't really talk about how they're made, but they're about 17 mil thick. So if you put one colony, queen right colony above another, um, they can't communicate between the gauze, so they can't exchange pheromones. So they don't really. There's no aggression. They'll live. They'll they'll live together quite well. So if I've got a small queen, a, a sing, single weaker box, I'm going to, this see this winter. I'm going to put it above a stronger double hive, sit it on top, and so the warmth from the stronger double hive will come up and the, my theory is that they will use if, even if they're lower on honey stores up the top here they'll they'll um won't have to use as much energy to keep warm i don't know Den what do you think dennis it's <laughs> yeah yeah dennis is a beekeeper of probably many 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 years so yeah so if you want to have a look at those yeah so that's what i'm Maybe I'll, I'll tell you how they go after winter. <laughs>